Picking blackberries. The middle of July in Northern Indiana is always sticky, icky hot, and the prospect of pulling on jeans and a long sleeve button down shirt to crawl under prickly blackberry vines was not very appealing. But mom was adamant that I was turning pale with bookworming and she was genuinely excited about the berry patch she'd found in the woods at the top of our street. I was 10, my sister was six, and our sharp little hound dog, Stormy, was about two at the peak of his tracking abilities. We set off, galvanized buckets in hand, <clears throat> up the neatly platted sidewalks of the post-World War II housing tract in which we lived. One block, then another half block, and then we were at the edge of the woods. There was a well-worn trail to the large tree fort we kids were forever cobbling together, and another trail along the edge of a steep embankment from which we could sight the community swimming pool. But mom led us deeper into the shaded woods, which still survived between encroaching developments. At the edge of the sandy path, I spotted a few berries and reached eagerly to pluck them from the vine and hear them plunk into the pail. Off to one side, I heard mom trampling down some underbrush and then a soft squeal of, oh, you should see how big these are. My sister was hanging back, eating the few berries she picked, but I urged her, Whoa. sorry, I hit something wrong. My sister was hanging back, but I urged her on and we trudged toward mom. As we went, we too began to see ever bigger berries just out of our grasp until the three of us were spread throughout the large patch crawling under, stretching up, holding one vine down with a foot and pulling another vine closer to us. My sister being shorter discovered that the largest berries grew in the deepest, coolest shade close to the ground. Soon I was inching on all fours, searching for the perfect berry, the one that was sweetest and juiciest and just slid down my throat. At first, we tasted as many as we threw in the buckets, and we laughed to see Stormy enjoying them as well, adeptly nibbling the ripest berries from the bottom of the vines. But what really kept us going through the dirt and the briars and the mosquitoes and the sweat dripping down our faces was not just the quest for another berry taste, but the thought of a blackberry cobbler for supper. Mom had promised that if we picked enough berries, she'd make the biscuit topping for this bubbling hot treat. So we concentrated on making the levels in our pails rise, calling across to each other with every largest and best berry we found. We returned to that patch several summers in a row before the berry vines fell to house lots and our picking expeditions faded into the soft glow of memory. And then several summers ago, as my sister and I took an early evening walk at the perimeter of a sand pit near her home in Southern Maine, we saw them once again wild blackberries. It was already too dark to find very many, so we got up early the next morning, put on anti-scratch, anti-insect layers, and headed out. It was my sister's birthday, and she was especially thrilled that we'd found them for that occasion. We started seeing the berries along the edges of the path, and we tried to be selective enough to get the blackest, ripest ones. That determination led us down both sides of an embankment on whose ridge we had been hiking. Thus, I would balance precariously with one hand around a sapling, one foot reaching for solid ground, and the other hand closing around a berry, giggling all the while. As we scrambled up and down the steep drop-offs, we crushed the stems and leaves of the sweet fern under our feet, and its cinnamony aroma filled the air around us as the sun tried to burn off the fog. Each time I emerged from below back up onto the path, I noticed another shed clothing item, either mine or my sister's, strewn along the way. First a blue hat, then a lavender bandana, then a turquoise sweatshirt, then a long sleeve white shirt. We laughed at our leavings. We exclaimed at our finds. You can't believe how good that one was, like blackberry wine. This one was pure essence of blackberry. Ah. Oh. Oh, you should see those big ones. There's an even bigger one. Oh, I'm falling down the hill. And of course, we reminisced about picking with mom when we were kids. 
My sister remembered that we once took a family friend and her girls with us when we went to the berry patch. That adult friend's biggest entertainment for the day was watching and listening to the three of us carry on about the berries. She was amused by our enthusiasm, but she didn't share it. To her, it was just too much work, too much sweat for a few wild berries. So what was it that made us so uninhibitedly joyous when we were picking berries together? I think on the surface, it was having mom share our child sense of wonder, curiosity, and adventure. But underneath, way down deep, it was her passing down to us a feeling of being at home in the woods, of making friends with something in the wild, even if it was only a blackberry vine, and of looking to nature to provide us with solace and fun in our lives. The experience never failed to leave all of our senses vibrating, the heat of July in our lungs and the cool, cool shade on our heads, the prickle of thorns on our hands, the buzz of bugs around our ears, the deep lush green of the woods filling our eyes and the dusky tartness of berry juice still on our tongues. That summer in Maine, my sister and I once more competed to see who could pick the most berries in the least time implying who could keep from eating the ones she found. We came out pretty even and she made a wonderful blackberry grunt for breakfast. I took two quarts back to Rhode Island with me and froze them, thinking I might get around to making the seedless blackberry jelly mom had been so fond of. But I much preferred just tossing a few au naturel into burbling pancakes, sprinkling some into an apple crisp, or loading up a muffin portion with berries. Best of all, I like my wildness straight, grabbing three or four berries from the freezer, rolling them around in my mouth until they thaw a bit, and then letting that woodsy flavor, like lemony sorrel leaves, bittersweet grass stems, and musky bark, all rolled into one, carry me back to that first berry patch with my sister, my dog, and my mom. Oops. Very good. Yes, I wanted to uh, uh, stretch out the suspense. Okay. So this is, um, this reading is from uh, the book Instructions to the Cook, a Zen Master's Lessons in Living a Life That Matters by the late Zen Roshi Bernie Glassman. When I first began to study Zen, my teachers gave me a koan. A Zen question to answer. How do you, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, quote, how do you go further from the top of a hundred foot pole? End quote. You can't use your rational mind to answer this con or any Zen question in a logical way. You might meditate a long time and come back to the Zen master saying, the answer is to live fully. That's a good beginning, but it's only the rational, logical part of the answer. You have to go further. You have to demonstrate the answer. You have to embody the answer. You have to show the Zen master how you live fully in the moment. You have to manifest the answer in your life, in your everyday relationships, in the marketplace, at work, as well as in the temple or meditation hall. When we live our life fully, our life becomes what Zen Buddhists call the supreme meal. We make the supreme meal by using the ingredients at hand to make the best possible meal. The, 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 make the best uh, meal possible, and then by offering it. At its deepest, most basic level, Zen or any spiritual path for that matter, is much more than a list of what we can get from it. In fact, Zen is the realization of the oneness of life in all its aspects. It's not just the pure or spiritual part of life. It's the whole thing. It's flowers, mountains, rivers, streams, and the inner city and homeless children on 42nd Street. It's the empty sky and the cloudy sky and the smoggy sky, too. It's the pigeon flying in the empty sky, the pigeon shitting in the empty sky, and walking through the pigeon droppings on the sidewalk. It's the rose growing in the garden, the cut rose shining in the basin, the living room, the garbage where we throw away and the compost where we throw away the garbage. Zen is life, our life. It's coming to the realization that all things are nothing but expressions of myself. And myself is nothing but the full expression of all things. It's a life without limits. 
There are many different metaphors for such a life, but the one I have found the most useful and the most meaningful comes from the kitchen. Zen masters call a life that is lived fully and completely with nothing held back, the supreme meal. And a person who lives such a life, a person who knows how to plan, cook, appreciate, serve, and offer this supreme meal of life is, call, is called a Zen cook. So it was the beginning of what I knew would be three years without steady income. I'd been accepted to seminary in Berkeley. We'd sold our expensive house in San Francisco and moved to the East Bay into a, a little house in the shadows of the elevated tracks of Bay Area rapid transit, affectionately known as BART. We were so close, in fact, that as I meditated in my living room every morning while the sun was still low, the shadow of passing trains would darken the room. And directly beneath the elevated bar tracks were paths for pedestrians and bicyclists. I'd ride to class every day, and on my way home, I would stop and pick some of the blackberries that grew all along those paths. Berries that were made sweeter by the shade provided by the tracks. I called them Bart berries, and I had them with homemade granola for breakfast, or I'd bake them into muffins, scones, or cobbler. I really appreciated the free food. When I first started doing that, the national economy was booming. Unemployment was low, and local restaurants were always packed. So passersby looked at me with the kind of disdain that they usually save for people sleeping in public parks or doorways. But after the economy turned a couple of years later, those same passersby started wondering what I was up to. They had no idea that those berries were edible and they'd stop and ask me what I did with them. Within a day or two, I would see them also picking and suddenly there was competition for the sweet darkness of those blackberries. It took financial challenges to make people notice the abundance that was there, the abundance that was always there surrounding them. But it doesn't always take me to spark attention. A few weeks ago, I made a vegetarian shepherd's pie for dinner. As a base, I used dried and fresh mushrooms in their own rich gravy, and I topped it with a layer of carrots sauteed with onions, and then a layer of buttery, garlicky mashed potatoes. It was baking when my dear husband got home. He smelled the air, and he asked what it was. When I told him, he said, that's not shepherd's pie. He was a little disappointed. Shepherd's pie, he said, has lamb. That's what shepherds have, not mushrooms, and corn, not carrots. He was very specific, but that didn't really resonate with what I know as shepherd's pie. See, in my family growing up, it was made with ground beef, as it was in the homes of everyone I knew. Of course, they called it shepherd's pie, but my Quebecois parents called it poto chinois, Chinese pie. I know it doesn't make any sense. There's nothing Chinese about it. But in poor families in French speaking Canada in the 1950s and 60s, just calling beef, corn, and potatoes Chinese felt exotic. It felt dare I say, oriental. And such is colonialism. Invade a nation, steal its resources, subjugate its people, then name things after them so that you can feel worldly. And it's not a uniquely Canadian colonialism that I'm talking about. There are common dishes in the United States with similar provenance, provenances, like American chop suey. It's a combination of macaroni, ground beef, stewed tomatoes, and maybe if you're daring some saute onions. There's absolutely nothing Chinese about it, 
but the name comes from a misunderstanding of a Chinese term invented for the Americanized dishes that Chinese immigrants would serve to white people in their restaurants. Loosely, it means something like a little of this and a little of that. But take those same three or four ingredients and add a pinch of brown paprika that you've had in your spice rack for two decades and poof, you've got yourself American goulash. I had a housemate in San Francisco who was born in 1956, just months after the Hungarian uprising when his parents fled. And a hundred times, I heard his rant about what Hungarian goulash really is. And I'll give you a hint, it's not that. But there's one variation on macaroni, ground beef and stewed tomatoes that I learned about in Ohio. Just start with that pound of pasta and cook it, then add the stewed tomatoes and onions with a pound and a half of shredded cheese on the top. And they got yourself something called Johnny Marzetti. Now, Joe and I were talking about all of this as we ate what I call shepherd's pie. And we both wondered, who was Johnny Marzetti? And why was this dish named after him? So of course we did what people do these days. We pulled out our phones and we Googled it. We were both reading the same Wikipedia article online, sitting across the table from each other. It turns out that an Italian immigrant named Teresa Marzetti was about to open a restaurant in Columbus, Ohio at the turn of the last century. There was a recession. So she wanted a signature dish that could be tasty, but more importantly, cheap to make. Now, her brother-in-law, Johnny, loved what she came up with, so she named it after him. And the dish, simple as it was, turned out to be exactly what people wanted. Now, Teresa's restaurant flourished for decades, and 130 years later, people are still eating Johnny Marzetti in Ohio. We didn't have to wonder anymore why it was called Johnny Marzetti. We killed our wonder about Johnny Marzetti. And then we just finished our dinner in silence. And later, as we washed and dried the dishes, I recalled how our friend Krishna, who lives in England, told us about the practice he and his local friends have when they eat out. They all put their smartphones in a pile at the center of the table. And the first person to reach for theirs has to pick up the check for everyone. Now, you'd think they'd be trying to stop each other from taking pictures or posting to social media or texting with their other friends. But really, their goal is to keep from doing what, I, what Joe and I did, killing conversation with facts. The truth is, it's so much more interesting to wonder, isn't it? And if everyone at a table, at a meal, is wondering who the heck Johnny Marzetti was, they could come up with all kinds of theories, which could morph into outlandish stories that everyone could add on to, like a great verbal game of exquisite corpse. You know, exquisite corpse is a parlor game for visual artists in which players draw a small section of a body on a piece of paper that's folded like an accordion. And they only get to see the previous section that somebody drew and nobody sees the whole thing until it all gets unfolded at the end. And it could be a mess or it could be weirdly beautiful, but the product isn't what matters. What matters is the process. Like exquisite corpse players, Krishna and his friends are nurturing a process, the artistic process of conversation. Because they know that when we know the answers, even if we only think we know the answers, we stop listening, we stop engaging. And for them, being open to new information and creating something delightful together is way more important than knowing trivial facts or being right. 
when we know the answers, we stop listening. We stop wondering. And Zen Roshi Bernie Glassman knew that. In the reading from instructions to the cook that Bill shared earlier, Bernie, who was a joyful bear of a man whom I adored, described the Zen cook as taking the ingredients available to make the supreme meal. And a person who lives the same way with the ability to notice and serve and appreciate all that that it has to offer is called a Zen cook. Now in a later book called Bearing Witness, he built on this theme saying that everything we have in life, all the friends and family, the stories and experiences are ingredients of who we are. And if we pay attention, if we really pay attention to those ingredients and approach them with a sense of wonder, a sense of not knowing, then we can use those ingredients to deepen our compassion and really live into our calling to be connected in more meaningful ways. Because like Krishna and his friends, he was aware that when we know the answers, we stop listening, we stop paying attention, we stop learning how to do better the things that really matter. Being present to the here and now and the joys and sorrows and the ideas of the people that we love. When we think we know, we don't notice the blackberries that are right there waiting to be picked and to have their juicy sweetness savored. So this is my spiritual challenge for you and for me. The next time we're curious about something, rather than reaching for the right answer, just sit with the wonder for a while. Let's use our curiosity to engage in conversation whose main ingredient is creativity. And when faced with a question, any question, let's try to not rush to find all the answers through endless research or surveys. Let's just look at each other, the people in front of us and ask more important questions. Like, how do you feel about that? What does it bring up for you? What story do you have to tell? And which ingredients would help you become more of a Zen cook? Well, there's always time for fact finding in front of our computers. Never a shortage of time for that. But while we're together, let's keep wonder alive. Let's pay attention to the ingredients we have available so we can all be Zen cooks. And if we can do that, we might come up with the next Johnny Marzetti, the thing that people didn't even know they want, but grow to love. We might find ourselves picking blackberries together, reveling in the wonder of it all. So now it would be great to end with a, re with a video of hymn number 311, Let It Be a Dance. And I hope that 